July 1984, the Lorraine hardware was complete and slowly being miniaturized. The microkernel XEC was almost complete thanks to Carl Sassenrath, and the Intuition GUI was almost there thanks to the framework of RJ Michael. But the software operating system which would drive all of this technology was still missing, and Carl Sassenrath's Chaos Project, which stood for Carl's Amiga operating system, had fallen way behind schedule. Originally, the plan was to develop the operating system in-house at the same time as all the other development processes, but due to mounting time constraints and a lack of cash, the company has had to spend the last of their reserves to hire third-party developers to complete the job. The Amiga management team were still waiting for a word from Commodore, and they sold the last of their property assets and cars trying to keep the business afloat, forcing J Minor to pay his staff from his own pocket. In July of 1984, Atari announces the MindLink Mind Control Peripheral for the Atari 2600, a crazy move considering the age of this second generation console in 1984. This is another wasted side project venture paid for by the departing Warner Communications. Players found they had to use their eyebrows and their forehead to control the game. Jack Trammell also cancels the Atari 5200 console. Also in July 1984, Amstrad shipped the first Amstrad CPC 464 units in the UK at just £249 with a green screen monitor or £359 with a colour monitor after the successful launch in June. Amstrad was founded in 1968 as Alan Michael Sugar Trading Limited. He bought Z12 and Stereo 25 preamp systems from Sinclair Radionics, installed them inside his own wooden cases and soon had a range of radio and hi-fi equipment of his own. Sugar teamed up with Ivor Spittle in 1983 to produce Arnold, the codename for the Colour Personal Computer, which ran at 4 MHz and had 64 kilobytes of memory. The machine could display 16 colours in low resolution mode, 4 colours or 2 colours at high resolution. Around 2 million Amstrad CPC 464 machines were sold worldwide. In August of 1984, Jack Trammell, having fired and cancelled almost everything at Atari, is handed an original agreement with the Amiga Corporation by one of his sons who's been rifling through a huge stack of papers. On Monday, August the 13th, 1984, Atari and Jack Trammell files a lawsuit against the Amiga Corporation for $100 million claiming the custom chips designed by Amiga were developed under contract from Atari and that despite Amiga having paid Atari's investment back with interest, Tramiel claimed that the contract had not been properly terminated. Jack hoped that by suing Amiga he might get to see or acquire the new chips and an injunction might at least delay the production and the release date of the Amiga. $100 million would also go a long way towards developing the Atari 520 ST. On August the 15th, 1984, Commodore purchases the Amiga Corporation for $27 million and buys into the company at $4.24 per share after a wild gamble offer price from Amiga Corp, far above the company's actual worth at that time, paid off. Commodore also gave Amiga Corp $1 million to spend on the Atari court case. The company is renamed Commodore Amiga Inc. and the computer they are working on now becomes the Commodore Amiga. Also at Commodore, the Westchester engineers situated above the Moss chip fabrication plant and the R&D labs are working on the TED design once again to produce the Commodore 128 ready to be shown at next year's January CES. Without Jack Trammell to stop them, Bill Hurd and Dave Haney and a small band of engineers would spare no expense when it came to testing and producing full-scale batches of quirky alterations to the ships. The fabrications known as fabs cost an absolute fortune and it wasn't long before they started to spend Commodore's money. In August of 1984, all the secrecy about the Amiga is broken when the Amiga is featured in Compute Magazine. 
The article contains some early information, including planned internal 320k IBM compatible disk drives, a built-in 300 bits per second modem, a chimney port for powering expansions, and even a front cartridge slot for games. None of those ideas made it into the final design. Around August the 27th, 1984, thanks to the backing of Commodore, the Amiga team are able to move 10 miles down the road to a new office location at 983 University Avenue, Building D, Los Gatos, California, 95030. Instead of groups of people all crowding around the same Sage 4, there are now one Sun computer to every desk. At that time, Sun 2 workstations ran Sun OS at around 10 MHz and these were very much in line with what the Amiga team wanted to offer. Also in August 1984, IBM announces the PCAT for $4,000 up to $6,700 for the expanded model. The IBM PC had started off very well despite being much less sophisticated than Amiga, Sierra or Gaza and the AT model helped to standardise the technology in the personal computer industry for the next decade. As an advanced third generation computer, the PC-AT had speed thanks to the 16-bit Intel 286 CPU at 6 or 8 MHz. A high resolution 640x200, 2-color or 320x200, 4-color CGA display and a large RAM space in the form of 256 kilobytes expandable up to 16 whole megabytes of RAM. The AT accommodated two high density 1.2 megabyte, five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives, a 20 megabyte hard drive, and some limited sound thanks to a built-in 2.25 inch magnetic speaker, but would not get its own fourth generation spec and GUI until Windows 1 came along 14 months later and would not get a complete fourth generation makeover until 1990 with the introduction of the IBM PS1. The EGA video card is released for the PC-80 in October, delivering 16 colours on the screen from a palette of 64. On August the 14th, 1984, IBM announces MS-DOS has been chosen for its new IBM PC AT machine, and PC DOS 3.0 is launched. IBM originally asked Microsoft to create an operating system for their IBM 5150 PC design in July of 1980. In July of 1981, Microsoft buy 86 DOS, aka QDOS, from Seattle's Tim Patterson for $50,000. They then rename the software MS-DOS and deliver it to IBM in October of 1981. But IBM find over 300 bugs in the software and decide to rewrite the program themselves, so that both companies held the copyright. Microsoft then licenses the final product back to IBM, who then rename it to PC-DOS 1.0 and the product sells for only $40 compared to many hundreds of dollars for the competition software, including Gary Kildall's CPM. Microsoft then licenses MS-DOS to over 70 other PC-compatible companies, thus creating a cheap and dominating operating system bundled with almost all PCs. By 1984, Microsoft's revenues had doubled every year in accordance with Moore's law, up to almost 100 million in revenues by the end of that year. On October the 3rd, 1984, in the Atari vs Amiga courts battle, Dave S. Morse is called to the stand at Santa Clara Superior Court and pleads innocent in front of Leonard Schreiber to missing the deadline calling the whole matter a misunderstanding. As the case continues, Commodore pay off the last of former Amiga Corp's debts, and the new Commodore Amiga team thankfully get back to finishing their new machine. In October 1984, 
Ayer Volinsky joins Atari from Commodore and begins to design the case for the Atari ST computer. Commodore gives Volinsky's old case design for the Commodore C900 to the Amiga team and Howard Stoltz takes over the Amiga case design and creates an impressive and stylish design with rounded corners. Someone suggests a garage door which would lift up to allow the keyboard to be stored inside whereby the slot under the case became known as the keyboard garage. The Amiga team also want to introduce their own signatures along with Mitch's paw prints which are embossed in the case. In November 1984, Commodore experts helped the Amiga team to improve the Lorraine design. They moved the NTSC signal converter to a new location, improving the NTSC colour quality and they brought the Amiga colour range up from 320 colours in 640 mode to 4096 and made a lot of small improvements that were beyond the finances of Amiga Corp. With the NTSC conversion now off the custom hardware, there was no need for hold and modify anymore and this was seemingly not so useful. Digiview are offered a demonstration of the Amiga hardware and designed their own colour image capture hardware extensively using the HAM mode. They get this ready for launch next July. In December 1984, the newly renamed Chaos Commodore Amiga operating system is in trouble after the third party development team had done nothing with their time and spent all of the Amiga money. After they learned that Amiga Corp had been bought out by Commodore, they demanded significantly more money than had originally been agreed upon. Commodore apparently tried to negotiate with them in good faith, but the whole deal fell through in the end, recalls RJ Michael, so he and several other key engineers worked 48 hour shifts and they tried to fix the software. According to Commodore engineer Andy Finkel, the management team decided that it wouldn't be possible to complete Chaos on time for the Amiga launch and especially since the software guys had already given up sleeping and going home at the weekends. So Chaos is cancelled and the Amiga looks for a solution from Metacomco who they met at the CES show who are based in Bristol, England and have an office in Pacific Grove, California and who may be able to provide Dr. Tim King's Tripos operating system and save them a lot of time and trouble and save the day. In January 1985, seven months ago to the launch of the Amiga, Tripos is acquired from Metacomco who also get busy converting their M-Basic program to the Amiga, which eventually became A-Basic, which was shipped with Amiga Workbench 1.0. Dr. Tim King himself spent a lot of time in a three-week rotation between Bristol, UK, Monterey and Commodore's HQ in Pennsylvania, and of course Amiga in California. Tripos became the basis for the new Amiga operating system, but came without any form of disk or hard drive file system, so they will have to write their own disk drive handlers, as well as updated drivers for serial, parallel and printers. Paul Sassenrath gets to work adapting the Tripos commands and creating the devices used in devs and the L folders. The functions of the GUI are called in by a set of libraries and after fonts and a few utilities and demos are added, Workbench 1.0 begins to take shape. Metacomco were also working with rival Atari to produce BASIC for the Atari ST and with Sinclair to provide a range of programming languages for the QL. On January the 5th, 1985, the Atari ST prototype presentation is held at the Las Vegas Winter CES show. Introducing models such as the Atari 260 ST with 256 kilobytes of RAM and the 520 ST with 512 kilobytes. Atari introduces the Atari 65XE computer at $149 and the Atari 130XE with 128 kilobytes of RAM for $399 to replace the aging Atari 400 and Atari 800 XL line. 
They also announced a 65XEP and a 65XEM machine, which were supposed to take over from the Atari 2600 but never actually shipped, as well as the Atari 130ST, the 260ST, which never made it into production, and Atari previewed the ST with a now famous animation of the Amiga Boing Ball completely ripping that off. The CES of 95 is also notable for the launch of the Nintendo Entertainment System in the US, albeit under the name Nintendo Advanced Video System, or AVS. This early input is far more elaborate than the final console, featuring the latest third generation options including a cassette drive and a full keyboard with a range of wireless controllers and a light gun thanks to designer director Lance Barr, all this for just $299. Nintendo had been waiting to release the Nintendo Enhanced Video System since 1983, when talks to release it through Atari broke down. When Atari saw Donkey Kong running on rival system ColecoVision at that summer CES, they refused to sign the deal, leaving Nintendo with no option but to rename the machine to the Advanced Video System and develop their own computer at considerable expense and they just had to hope that they had enough marketing clout to make it a success. Unfortunately, this Famicom prototype is deemed a failure at the CES, and customers are wary of the infrared wireless controllers, fearing a person walking in front of the screen could affect their game. Nintendo go away from the CES and redesign the case again, this time moving away from anything which made it look like a computer, and they moved the top loading cassette slot of the Famicom into a new chamber inside the unit. The new model will be released in October. Also at the Winter CES, Commodore International officially cancels production of the ever popular VIC-20 and unveils the Commodore 128 personal computer. This third generation 8-bit Commodore 128 contains a 4 MHz Silog Z80A chip clocked down to 2 MHz for use in CPM mode, and it also has the latest 6502 derivative 8502 chip clocked at 2 MHz, or less than 1 depending on the mode selected. It contains 128 kilobytes of RAM, expandable up to 512 kilobytes, a high resolution 80 column by 25 row text mode, or 640x200 pixel graphics display mode, which actually looked like 640x400 thanks to the scan doubling effect. The 128 came with three built-in operating systems, C128 mode, which was a high resolution graphics display option, the CPM mode, which was compatible with CPM3 and used a Z80 chip, or Commodore 64 mode, which attempted to emulate a Commodore 64, as this was still a force in the market. The C128 also came in three flavours, a one-piece C28 for $299.95, which was released initially with a case very much inspired by Ira Volinsky's work can be seen in the TEDs and the Atari ST. In 1987, a two-piece 128D model was introduced, which came with a built-in five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive, and either a metal or a plastic case, which looked very much like an Amiga 1000. Confused customers wondered why they needed a machine with a Commodore 64 mode, when all they needed was a Commodore 64, and so the C128 became yet another Commodore cash draining flop. Commodore also shows the Commodore LCD laptop computer at the 85 Winter CES, which Commodore developed thanks to owning an LCD company and being the first to market this technology. The Commodore LCD featured a built-in software system with a built-in modem and a flip-top screen but the machine fails to get any orders and the prototype is abandoned with three known prototypes known in existence. On January the 14th, Commodore International and Electronic Arts create the Interchange File Format, otherwise known as IFF, 
for graphics, sound, text, animation and other file types. Trip Hawkins at Electronic Arts had been a huge supporter of the Amiga since the plan was unveiled and was one of the very first developers to receive a D-Series Amiga developer kit. EA will continue to work on a selection of games ready for the Amiga's launch in July and use IFF to develop their own bitmap editor with Dan Silver known as Deluxe Paint. In February 1985, Commodore's patience with endless updates and tinkering with the Amiga had finally disintegrated and they pushed the Amiga team hard to complete their machine. The debut of the Atari ST in January had hit Commodore hard, who realised that they no longer were ahead in the race to develop a low-cost 16-bit computer. Due to a fall in sales of the Commodore 64, again, the burden on the Commodore 16 and Plus 4, coupled with the failure of just about everything else, forces Commodore's financial situation to head downhill. In April 1985, Commodore Amiga released the Amiga D500 series development system, otherwise known as Velvet. This is the third and most complete system to date, the D-Series still have 128 megabytes of system RAM, and the three custom chips are now based inside their own prototype RCs. The wooden keyboard case is gone, the kickstart moves up to a 128 kilobytes version 0.4, and the ROM hosts a series of updates including a Dancing Fools graphics library dated the 1st of April 1985. Only five D500 series Velvet systems are known to exist. On the 1st of May 1985, Quantum Computer Services begins operation of Quantum Link, a modem accessed Commodore specific C64 and Commodore 128 telecommunications network. The company is later renamed America Online and is the first large internet provider. Initially, Quantum Link is a subscriber service where users have to pay to surf. But as competition grew from CompuServe, which started in 1969 as a way to network PDP machines and other cheaper ISPs forced America Online to slash its premium service and now it was the first time most users experienced the internet for the price of a local telephone call. On May the 8th, 1985, Atari officially launched the Atari 520 ST personal computer. The ST is a fourth generation computer. ST stands for 16, S and 32, T, referring to the 16-bit bus and 32-bit internal processing of the 68,000 CPU. It came with 512 kilobytes of RAM and a 320 or 640 times 200 display. It came with a Tramel operating system or TOS or TOS including a CPM DOS mode and a Gem GUI desktop, both provided by Digital Research, and also ST Basic by Metacomco. The ST did not have an Agnes chip, it had no copper core processor or a blitter to quickly copy data either. It came with a shifter chip to basically do this and a glue chip to hold everything together lost around 7% in system performance over the Amiga and news reporters dubbed the new machine the Jackintosh. On May the 31st, 1985, Thomas Rattigan of the North American Business Group, formerly of PepsiCo, in an interview with David Sanger of the New York Times, said that Commodore will come out with a Unix-based Micro in direct competition with AT&T's Unix-based PC in the next year. Commodore were in fact hoping to use Unix again after the failed C900 project, but it would be some time before Unix was officially supported on the Amiga. On June the 14th, 1985, Microsoft announces Windows 1.0 will be ready to ship in November. After years of converting programming languages to machines and porting the disk operating system to almost every PC and clone, and after announcing the new Windows software on November the 10th, 1983, Microsoft is at last ready to release their first GUI. Windows 1 is based on the Xerox Alto desktop metaphor and System 1.0 for the Apple Mac. 
It is very basic with limited use of color and is a simple launch pad for existing DOS applications. The first Windows dedicated applications are also started around this time to be ready for the launch. On June the 19th, 1985, the ex-director of research and development at Commodore and the new lead developer of the Atari ST, Shira Shibji, along with Arthur Morgan, John Honig, Douglas Wren and other people are held by the US District Court for stealing blueprints for Commodore with the Z8000 disk drive before they left Commodore's Westchester office in Pennsylvania to join Atari Corp last year. Atari needed the plans to help complete the design of this T and encouraged Commodore staff to steal important documents and put the rest of their research through the shredder. The court was unable to prove this and acquitted Shiraz and the ex-Commodore staff of any wrongdoing while Commodore had to pay all the damages. On July the 23rd, 1985, the Amiga launches at a Star Study Gala held at the Vivian Beaumont Theatre in the Lincoln Center in New York. Commodore International unveils the new Amiga A1000 computer. It features a multitasking, multi-window operating system, a very high resolution color graphics mode featuring up to 4096 colors, and a four channel stereo sound. The machine carries a Motorola 68000 CPU, now 256 kilobytes of RAM, and an 880 kilobytes 3.5 inch floppy disk drive. All this for a 1295, yes, that's $1,295. At launch, the Commodore Amiga A1000 computer had a Kickstart 0.7 boot disk which loaded into an additional 256k of reserved memory inside the computer. Workbench is now Beta 0.6, which also contained Textcraft Development Version 1.5 and Artronics Graphicraft Pre-Release 0.6. Debbie Harry and Andy Warhol demonstrate the graphics of the Amiga using a combination of the Digiview image software and the Graphicraft Paint program. The conference is hosted by lead software engineer Bob Pariso, who wears a tuxedo and ushers each demonstration like a conductor. First a demonstration of word processing with text craft, and then an amazing graphics in hand mode demonstration showing all 4096 colors at once in 640x400. Then a sample of Deep Purple Smoke on the Water is played, then a demo filled with triangles played at 30 frames per second, and then an internal demo known as Robo City is next. Followed by a tour of the Amiga's sound capabilities and its modulated speech, this is Amiga speaking. and lastly ending with the classic Amiga Boing Ball animation from the CES show the year before. The presentation also featured four emulators on one disc, known as the Amiga Transformer, where the Amiga would now boot into PC-DOS and run Lotus 123. It would also run Apple Macintosh emulation with System 1.0 and loaded and played C64 games and even had a BBC microcomputer emulator on just the one disc. The Amiga's Transformer disc was not available to buy and it would take many years before further software emulators were written to try to accomplish the same job. By that time, the Amiga team's dream that the Amiga would be the world's first fully cross-platform fourth-generation machine had evaporated. On July the 25th and 26th, 1985, Commodore Amiga secretly previews the Amiga computer at the SciGraph conference in San Francisco, attended by 27,000 people. RJ Markle and several other people want to announce the new machine at the public event formally, but management makes sure that the machine is kept under wraps for now. In August 1985, Silicon Graphics announced the Iris 2400 Turbo, which is an update to their Iris 2000 computer, which used a Motorola M68010 clocked at 10 MHz. 
The new Iris Turbo features 12 VSLI pipeline geometry engines to co-process 3D in real time using the Motorola 68020 CPU as its main processor clocked at 16 MHz. It is everything the Amiga team hoped for from their budget microcomputer except it comes with 2 MB of memory, 10 or 20 workstation expansion slots and a price tag of somewhere around $6,000 with the VSLI co-processor board coming in at $7,500 bringing this unit based system in at around $13,500 which would be the equivalent of $30,000 today. In August 1985, after the launch of the Commodore Amiga, Commodore were keen to promote the Amiga as being fully PC compatible. Jay Miner and Dave Needle were among the ones opposed to this plan, firstly because the software PC emulator on the transformer disc was very slow and they thought this performance loss over a real PC might hurt the Amiga's image. And secondly because they thought a fully compatible PC machine would mean software developers simply wrote PC code which would work on all PC compatible computers rather than writing killer applications specifically for the Amiga. And so PC compatibility was buried and forgotten by the Los Gatos team while Commodore did not forget and released the Commodore A1060 sidecar hardware solution in 1986 and a series of bridge boards to try to bridge the gap to the runaway PC market. Also in August 1985, the Amiga is featured entirely throughout the August issue of Byte magazine. They gave the Amiga a glowing review but wondered how this machine would stack up against the Macintosh. In September 1985, Commodore officially tries again to reintroduce their Unix based Commodore Z8000, otherwise known as the Commodore 900 business computer range. Commodore say that they are ready to ship the C900 but still no orders appear. 500 C900 computers are actually manufactured for the anticipated demand but none of these were actually sold to the public and so the last remnants of Jack Trammell's original dream machine are thrown out as scrap. On September the 6th, 1985, Commodore Amiga officially completes Workbench version 1.0. The operating system enables files to be operated, saved and retrieved from disk thanks to a file system and disk track handlers built into the software. Workbench 1.0 is also bundled with Metacomco's ABASIC on a separate extras disk with a number of demos. Commodore has already commissioned Microsoft to create Microsoft BASIC for the Amiga in order to provide business market credibility but Microsoft has deliberately dragged their feet to create programs for non-Intel based architectures until they realised the success of the Apple Macintosh and now they are suddenly interested again. In the meantime, Commodore has had to turn to Metacomco who quickly converted DR Basic, which they had created for the digital research company, as a way to cover this shortfall. Three demos are included on the main workbench disk to demonstrate the fast fill and line draw and of course the multitasking with a new disk copy appearing in the system drawer and a simple notepad program appearing in utilities. The workbench preferences and a clock are also present. The former method of computer input and operation, the command line interface, is now semi-hidden away as a CLI tool from which commands can be executed. The background colour of Workbench was changed a number of shades of blue before the final colour was chosen as the best colour to be able to read white text as the team deliberately wanted to move away from the black and white monochrome GUIs and tried to break out of the Mac-alike label they had been given by the press. A new shop window demonstration program is also made to demonstrate the Amiga to clients and to dealers. On September the 16th, 1985, Steve Jobs resigns from his position as chairman of the Apple Computer Company Board of Directors. 
Steve Wozniak had left Apple in 1981 after crashing his own aeroplane, but came back in 1983, then resources for the Apple II division started to drain towards the Apple Macintosh project. On February the 19th, 1985, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak went to the White House to receive the first ever National Medal of Technology Awards, presented by President Ronald Reagan. By early 1985, plans for an expansion to the 1983 Apple IIe were being cancelled, even though fans of the Apple II range demanded more technology. Wozniak considered the Apple II as his personal dream and sold his stock and left the company. Steve Jobs considered the Apple Macintosh as his personal dream, so when CEO John Scully demanded he step down from the Macintosh team due to Jobs' constant meddling, Jobs took it personally. He couldn't see a reason to hang around Apple any longer and resigned, later to form a new company next. The 8-bit Apple II series continued with the Apple IIc and ended with the Apple II GS which was discontinued in November 1993, after the range had sold five and a half million units. Around September the 24th, 1985, Commodore has started volume shipments of the Amiga computer to more than 400 retail outlets throughout the United States. They also launched a brand new 40 million ad campaign to hit the airwaves. Sources say Commodore will make a big splash. Amiga now comes with Kickstart 1.0, Workbench 1.0, and 256 kilobytes of memory, expandable to 512K thanks to a memory expansion slot on the front of the case. In October 1985, Gordon Moore's Intel introduces the 8386 microprocessor. 386 is a 32-bit version of the same processor family going back to the 8086 and has full compatibility. It came with 275,000 transistors and operated between 12 and 40 MHz. Initially, these new innovations were too expensive to affect the home consumer market, but it would take a few years before many home users could afford them and instead opted for the price reduced 8286, which was comparable to the Amiga's 68000 in terms of end user speed, and Intel vs Motorola CPU war had truly begun. On October the 18th, 1985, the newly redesigned and renamed Nintendo Entertainment System NES 101 is re released in North America. The family computer, originally designed in 1982, had been transformed by Lance Barr into the advanced video system for American customers and had failed. Nintendo's marketing department blamed the price of their new computer and that customers didn't really want to code it, they just wanted to play the games. So they removed all of Barr's additions and he created a simple box design larger than the Famicom. The machine takes on a new wave of loyal supporters, and thanks to a library of cheaply imported games, the machine became established. It would go on to be the highest selling video games console of all time, registering over 64 million units worldwide, with the last units rolling off the Japanese production line in September of 2003 which is quite surprising considering the basic Famicom hardware being used was designed to beat the original Atari 800 line when work began in 1982. The 6502 and picture processing units displayed 52 colours, of which 24 colours could be used on screen at any time, and in Europe they would fight a major battle of the next decade with latecomer 8-bit system, the Sega Master System. On October the 20th, 1985, the Sega Mark III is released in Japan, which would later be imported into North America and renamed the Sega Master System in September of 1986. The Sega Mark III is a redesigned system which remains compatible with the original Sega computer video game SG-1000 console introduced in 1983, the SG-1000 Mark II console, 
and the failed SC3000, Sega's first and only home computer. The Sega Mark III is a third generation console featuring a Zilog Z80 CPU at 4MHz, it features 8KB of system RAM, 16KB of expensive VRAM, video RAM and able to produce a 256 x 192 pixel resolution display with 32 colours out of 64 on screen at once. It featured a GPU and a video display processor allowing up to 64 sprites on screen and had 4 channel mono sound. Games could be loaded from cartridge and saved via Sega cards. Initially the machine sold poorly and arguments with Nintendo over game publishing rights meant Sega had to produce their own games with Activision and Parker Brothers providing third party games support. Also in October 1985, Commodore hit the road on a 40 city tour of the US in an effort to drum up support for the Amiga. 260 nationwide dealers had signed up by August after seeing the demo at the CES. Commodore hoped to gain 500 US dealers by the end of that year. At this stage, Commodore are still promoting the Amiga as a serious business machine and overrule Amiga Corp who wanted to include two joysticks with the computer to promote it as the ultimate games machine. Commodore can't decide if marketing the computer as a business machine is a good idea but also fails to market the product as a serious games machine either. Business users consider the Amiga too cheap to be a serious machine with no compatibility with leading PC software. They are confused as to why they need multi-bitmap screen modes, hardware sprites and 4 channel stereo sound when most business applications were monochrome and silent. Home users consider it too expensive as a games machine and have yet to see any gaming software which really shows off the computer. Instead of the new Commodore 128, many chose to buy or keep their existing Commodore 64s. Some magazines write the Amiga GUI off as Macintosh alike and deride the new contender compared to the superiority of the Apple and the emerging mega dominance of the IBM PC. In 1985, Microsoft announced the MSX2 computer and get ready to ship in 1986. The MSX1 was a rebranded Spectra Video SV318 console marketed in Japan by Microsoft Vice President Kazuhiko Nishi, which was sold with the Microsoft Extended Basic, hence the name MSX. The console was originally presented to the American market at the CES in 1985, which was quickly written off as a retro 8-bit machine with its price point of $500, way above Jack Trammell's lost leading Commodore 64 at just $199. In response to the MSX2 project, SpectraVision released the Spectra Video SVI738 Express Portable Computer featuring an 8-bit Zilog Z80A CPU, a built-in 3.5-inch disk drive and a 256 x 192 pixel display. It also featured 16 kilobytes of expensive video RAM and 3-channel sound. The 738 portable came with MSX DOS and MSX BASIC and was fully compatible with MSX games failed to gain any interest in America and sold only a little in Europe. Although the original MSX sold over 7 million units worldwide, the MSX2 was not a huge step forward and Microsoft quickly sell its remaining rights to MSX third party manufacturers such as Sony, Philips and Yamaha. On November the 20th 1985, Windows 1.0 is launched by Microsoft for $100. It's multitasking all right. <laughs> Unlike the tiny Amiga group which developed Workbench, Microsoft has been working on their own desktop metaphor with similar GUI features, icons which open applications and filing structures, pull down menus and a range of applications including Microsoft Excel 
which had already been shipped for the Apple Macintosh on the 30th of September. Five days later, on November the 25th, 1985, Commodore Amiga completes Workbench 1.1. This fixes a number of serious issues with 1.0 and adds a new narrator device to help translate text to speech. 1.1 has a calculator, an icon editor, and an updated extras disc, this time containing basic 1.0, which was created by Microsoft. Completed on October the 23rd, 1985. The later Workbench 1.0 Extras and 1.1 Extras Disc also contains Amiga Tutor, which is another demonstration program, this time written by Australian company Mindscape, designed to show off the many interesting aspects of the machine and to show a user how to operate it. Workbench 1.1 was also often bundled with the Craft software suite with Graphic Craft, Music Craft, and Text Craft, which were completed in October. Also in development was a spreadsheet CalCraft and presentation software Presentation Craft, but these are delayed due to the new developments of Workbench. In November 1985, MaxiSoft ships MaxiCom, the first commercially available dumb terminal emulation communications program for the Amiga. On December the 3rd, 1985, the New York Times announces that Thomas J. Rattigan, until last year the president and CEO of PepsiCo's International Bottling Division, will take over from Marshall Smith as president of Commodore International. Rattigan begins to take the focus away from the Commodore 128 machine, and he is put in charge of the sales and marketing of the Amiga. On December the 23rd, 1985, Electronic Arts complete the Amiga 1000 Polyscope demo. This is the first time the real capabilities of the Amiga have been seen with this amazing demonstration of graphics. The Polyscope demo is arguably the very first showcase demo written for the Amiga after the Amiga team's own Robo City animation showed what the Amiga could really do. Several other demos from this time show the smooth colour fills and the amazing hand mode, able to produce 256 colours on the screen at once, or 4096 colours in a static photorealistic image. On December the 31st, 1985, Electronic Hearts has just begun shipments of its first five products to the Amiga. Deluxe Paint, Archon, Financial Cookbook, Seven Cities of Gold, and Julius Irving and Larry Bird go one-on-one. -on -one. EA produce a demo slideshow of these products, along with Marvel Madness, Sky Fox, Deluxe Adventure Construction Set, Deluxe Music Construction Set, Deluxe Video, and Deluxe Print. These titles are the birth of the Amiga software industry, an industry which will thrive and produce thousands of titles, transforming the Amiga from a powerhouse of potential into a workhorse of productivity and entertainment. Dan Silver's Deluxe Paint became a breakthrough digital image editing software for the Amiga, which was a rewrite of Prism, which he wrote for the IBM PC, which was itself an enhanced version of Doodle, which Dan created for the Xerox Dandelion system. The simplicity of its use is often cited as to why people got interested in the Amiga. Electronic Arts have also begun working with the Los Gatos team to create a number of new games. Arctic Fox will be an interpretation of the idea of a three-dimensional game the machine was built for and highlighted in the original Atari documents. They also start to design the very first Amiga Flight Simulator, which they hope will fulfill J Miner's dream of a flight simulator with four channel stereo sound on the Amiga. With the first games and software now emerging and Workbench 1.1 now complete, and this marks the end of the original Amiga team's involvement with the A1000 computer and the Amiga had now successfully been delivered to the world. Just last night, I was lost in the jungle with Pitfall Harry. 
surrounded by giant scorpions and man-eating crocodiles. Well, Harry and I just grabbed the van, swung through the trees, and over the tar pits and found the jungle treasure. It was really neat. If you haven't met Pitfall Harry, you're missing the year's most incredible video game adventure. Pitfall for the Atari 2600 and in television. Since I met Pitfall Harry, no other man will do. Pitfall, designed by David Crane for Activision. Yeah? You look like a real jerk. Well, I am a corporate executive. He stops exciting things from happening. So what you doing? <laughs> Ice Hockey by Activision. Think you're ready for it? <laughs> One of the roughest video games around for your Atari game system? Ready to battle for the puck? Well... To inflict fierce body checking? Yeah. Furious stick checking? Yeah. Ruthless tripping! Yeah. You really think you're ready for all that? I'm ready! I'm ready! Fine. Catch your charge. Ice Hockey by Activision! Welcome to this hour's update. Top of the galactic news is the continuing space battle on Galaxy 48. In spite of relentless attacks when alien space armada, the mothership continues to hold her own. And now some rather bizarre local news. A man was rescued today from a dark and sinister cavern deep underground. Dubbed by police as the Night Stalker, he told terrifying tales of deadly bats, poisonous spiders, and robots trying to kill him with laser guns. Laser guns weren't involved in this next news item, but a peaceful corner of the Earth was devastated today as a typhoon centering off the islands of Utopia swept inland, destroying in its path a complete industrial complex. And now some Hollywood movie gossip. Soon America will thrill to the danger and devastation of deadly discs. Look out for the future. Looking for a powerful home computer? This is the one. Texas Instruments Home Computer. With 16K memory, it can take you a long way. Want a computer with a lot of software? Oh, yeah, this is the one. The TI Home Computer gives you more of these software cartridges than any computer in the world. The whole world. So, with all the power you have here to run all the power here, this is the one. The Home Computer from Texas Instruments. This is the one. Looking at a small portable computer called the IBM 5100, it's helping a lot of different people do their work more productively. Managing real estate investments entails many difficult decisions. Do I pay it now or later? What about the landscaping? Can we afford it? What about taxes? There are many, many difficult decisions to make. It's really nice having a computer to help. It weighs about 50 pounds. You can plug it in anywhere. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. Are you keeping up? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. Are you keeping up? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. In a world of high technology and ever-changing moves, in a world that's full of make belief and changing attitudes, are you keeping up with the Commodore? Because the Commodore is keeping up with you.
Lisa. And she's the most exciting thing to happen in computers today. The Lady Lisa. Beautiful. A classic triumph for Apple. Pure and simple graphic images and a clever pointing device called a mouse. But most importantly, unlimited expandability, unlimited power. Lisa, from Apple. The future today at Wallace Micromart. Hey, if you're thinking of buying a personal computer and all the signs say it's time to take the first step a few questions may still be holding you back Will your PC have the power you want to run the software you want? What about expandability and optional equipment? And how much money is it going to take? Buy my computer. Hey, hey, buy my computer. No, buy my computer. There's one way to cut through today's computer clutter. Compare other business computers with Radio Shack's Tandy TRS-80 Model 2000. Judge the ease of operation, speed, graphics, software, and price. Compare. I believe your informed buying decision will be the Tandy 2000 Personal Computer. Announcing a fabulous sale on the Commodore Plus 4 Personal Computer. The first computer with four built-in software packages. The big four every computer owner needs. Built-in graphics and sound commands. 128 colors, 64K memory, 75 commands. Word processing for letters, reports. Create graphics, graphs, charts, full color designs. Balance checkbooks, business statements, income tax. File management for mailing lists, inventories, recipes. Retailers originally sold the Commodore Plus 4 for $299.95. Now it's yours for only $99.95 complete. We'll include $150 in discount coupons towards special options. Use your credit card and order the incredible Commodore Plus 4, the $99.95 computer package you've been waiting for. Hey, friends. Are you tired of your neighbor whizzing by in his 386 computer while you still putter around in your Econobox 286? Are you embarrassed because your kid's Super Nintendo's got 256 colors and you've got a piddly 16? Well, friends, have I got the computer for you. Introducing the Ultimedia M57 SLC. It slices, it dices, it splices your multimedia data. Well, it'll even Julian fries. Just get the potato and that little door in the front. What do you get for your money? Well, you get the M Audio card. It does 8-bit, 16-bit, mono, and stereo. It'll make sounds only your dog can hear. That'll be good for leaving Fido those all-important voicemail messages. And you get the XGA display adapter. 64,000 colors for more natural image display. 64,000 colors. That's like a thousand boxes of crayons. And I'm talking about the big boxes with the built-in sharpener. Now, what do you think a computer like that's worth? Wait, don't answer. You want the Ginsu knives? You don't need the Ginsu knives. This baby's on the cutting edge of technology. Just take a look at that CD-ROM drive. It plays audio CD, CD-ROM CDXA. Get your red book, your yellow book, your orange book. Trailer's got the color, we'll get the book for it. And take a look at this fancy front panel. Well, it's got a headphone and a microphone jack right there in the front of your computer. And it's got a hi-fi speaker. And it's a little volume control knob for your listening pleasure, right there. If you want to get that for your computer, you pay $100 alone for that, baby. Now, what do you think it's worth? Wait, there's more. You want the bamboo steamer? Forget the bamboo steamer. This baby's hot. It's got the 386 SLC processor, the fastest 386 on the planet. And when I'm saying it's hot, I mean it's hot. This baby will heat up a 10 by 12 office in the dead of winter. Little demonstration. This is your brain. This is your brain on multimedia. How much do you think this advanced operating environment is worth? Wait just one minute before you answer. Watch as Windows integrates Lotus 123 with Miami Vice. Now we can take this Ferrari and paste it right into Windows Write. Now how much do you think Microsoft Windows is worth? Don't answer. Wait until you see Windows Write and Windows Paint and to listen to what else you get at no extra charge. The MS-DOS executive, an appointment calendar, a card file, a notepad, a clock, a control panel, a terminal, a print spool, a RAM driver, and can you believe it? Reversi! That's right! All these features in Reversi, all for just... How much did you guess? Five hundred? A thousand? Even more? No, it's just ninety-nine dollars! That's right! It's ninety-nine dollars! It's an incredible value, but it's true! It's Windows from Microsoft! Order today! 